Good morning, my name is Jamie Fitzpatrick and I serve as the president of Michigan Virtual. And I would like to uh, welcome you to our professional development half day session. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our educators uh, that are online today and, and those around the state that have um, done incredible things this past year to help our children along this difficult journey. Your, uh, your efforts are noticed and greatly appreciated. I'd also like to thank Wendy Zadeb, who's the executive director of the Michigan Association of School Principal, Secondary School Principals, and her talented team, along with uh, my colleagues at Michigan Virtual for the great collaboration and hard work to, to plan this half-day professional development program. And I think we all know that teaching and learning in a pandemic has proven to be a challenge for everyone involved. We hope today's half-day uh, program offers you some useful advice, some encouraging voices, and most of all, some practical resources needed to successfully complete this school year uh, and future school years. I think we all know that, uh, that we're probably not going back to what we thought of as normal over a year ago. We have a series of breakout sessions this morning focused on topics such as building relationships in an online space, uh, leadership, practical tips, tools, and techniques for teaching online, as well as some sessions focused on mental health and social emotional learning. We will be tweeting throughout the event and would love for you to use the hashtag TTT21, that's TTT21. Um, I'd like to introduce a student that we have with us this morning. I think we all know that writing gives students of all ages an outlet to express their feelings and connect with others during this unsettling time in their lives. I would like to introduce Ife Martin, who is a junior at West Bloomfield School. Uh, Ife is a 16-year-old uh, young artist. She discovered her spoken word voice by writing pieces that help her process social and, and mental health issues among youth. She is a member of the Performing Arts Company, Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit, and also enjoys participating in the Inside Out Literary Arts Citywide Poets Workshops. She is a 2021 National Youth Arts winner. Ife joined us this morning to share some of her, one of her writings. Good morning, Ife. Good morning, how are you today? I'm, I'm doing great. We're looking forward to hearing your, uh, your poem. I'm looking forward to performing. Um, good morning, everybody. I'll be performing my piece, School Days. It's day 55 now of quarantine. My bed's become my school desk, the kitchen's the cafeteria. Zoom calls are now school halls, the only places I can see the faces of my friends. 11 o'clock's now my first bell. Funny, I'd usually be in math right now and no more passing times. Now we're just passing times going through TikTok and Instagram. Our front yards and back ones have become playgrounds. I, I went to recess, I haven't done that in years. The secret routes from class to class are now dissolving in my memory. I try to save, but files corrupt. School's online now, no need to remember. No more counting down the days until summer break, but the sun's shining brighter and the days are going faster. I looked outside and winter's melted into spring. Fresh air is being filtered through this new trend, face mask. But that was then. This is now. Nothing's changed but time and perspective. It's day. Honestly, I lost count. We're still trying to find this new normal. But this isn't online school, it's school online. I don't think folks understand how much harder this is. I float from the kitchen to the basement and back to my room. There's no more excitement to school, it's just silence. My Wi-Fi drops more than a beat on a rap song. Mais c'est la vie, tout du vivre. At least I'm still doing good in French. We spend hours on end talking to a computer screen, then hours on end staring at our phone. School, homework, then free time. We get more blue light than sun. Car rides to the grocery store feel like field trips. An escape from the walls boxing me in. But I won't complain because I like the freedom. There's more time to get to know me. The stress hasn't dissipated, but I think I handle it better. I'm hypnotized by life itself. Now I'm living in the school days. Wow. Thank you. I Ife, I have a 16 year old daughter and many of the words that you just spoke um, just resonate because I've heard many, many of those same things from my own daughter. 
Uh, I know you composed this piece at the beginning of the pandemic last spring. I'm just curious, how much has changed for you and how much has uh, stayed the same? Well, obviously a lot has changed. Um, as we all know, everything is changing constantly. And this piece was actually written in two parts. The first part of the piece was written about two months into um, virtual learning and um, this whole quarantine. And so that reflected kind of the chaos that everything was and how everything was just very, very different. And then um, the second part was written, I think December. Um, my school started to get like a handle more on um, virtual learning, but it still wasn't the same as we all know as in-person learning, um, but we did get a lot better. But now I'm changing once again and we are, my school's in hybrid learning. So I'm in school four days a week and I'm virtual one day. And comparing that to how school was before on the pandemic, it's just immensely different. Um, there's less people, how we run classes is all different. We are not able to collaborate as much. Um, so there's just, as we all know, a lot going on, but I, I'm happy to say, I think things are going back to some type of normal. Um, even though it's hard for us to say, I think we are finding our groove in this time. Well, it sounds like you've been able to figure out a way to just stay incredibly positive during this difficult period. I'm just curious, we've got hundreds of educators from around the state of Michigan joining us this morning. If, if you were to share something with them that you think they kind of need to hear from you, what would, what would that message be? Um, I think just from all the students, um, to let you guys know that we are trying. Uh, we're all dealing with pandemic and as much as you ed educators are working very hard to create an education that is similar to what we had before the pandemic and keeping us um, up to date on everything that we need. Uh, us students are trying. Um, there's a line in my poem, this isn't online school, it's school online. And unless like we are taking Mich Michigan virtual classes, it's most likely not an actual online learning um, environment. So, and even if it is, it's really different for most students to adjust to. And just to let it, let you guys know that it hits all of us differently and we're all affected some way by the pandemic, by the social climate, by what's go just going on in our lives because life is still going on. And um, as students, we have to acknowledge that teachers are human, but um, teachers also have to remember that our students are, are human too. Sometimes we're tired of being on the computer all day. Um, sometimes we miss our friends. Sometimes there's things outside going on that are just affecting us inside the classroom. So while we're trying our best and we know you're trying our best, we just have to find that middle ground and um, come, to mid come to the middle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ife, for sharing your voice with us um, through your art today. And uh, we will take take and make sure that we get um, all of the participants that are with us today uh, access to your poem so that they have the, the written version if they would like to, to read it again. Thank you so much and best of luck as you finish out your junior year. Obviously not a, not a typical junior year for you and your, and your classmates. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mitch Album. Most of you are familiar with this best-selling author and award-winning columnist um, and philanthropist. Um, Mitch is the author of Tuesdays with Maury. It's the best-selling memoir of all time in which he relayed the life lessons of his college, college professor imparted to him during what he called the final class. Mitch is with us today to share some special messages uh, with Michigan educators. My colleague, Ann Kraft, will facilitate a brief Q&A session related to Mitch's presentation. So please put your questions in the Q&A section and we'll get to them, um, as many of them as we possibly can. Mitch, thank you for being with us today and welcome. Thank you. I, I assume you can see me because all I'm seeing is a big slide of myself, which is kind of disconcerting, but. We, we, we can. 
Um, I have to look over my own image in order to talk to you. So this is definitely a challenge, but uh, what else is new in these times? Oh, there you go. Whoever did that, thank you. You got rid of it. And now I see everybody. That was, yeah, I don't want to be looking at myself. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, giving me a couple of minutes to speak to you. I, for those of you who don't know, have a always a special place in my heart for teachers, uh, particularly as someone who wrote Tuesdays with Maury and then has probably met tens of thousands of teachers around the world as a result of it. Uh, I wrote the book with an appreciation of one particular teacher, but I have come as a result of that book to have an appreciation for multitudes of teachers. And I thought when I was asked to say a few words here in this, in this meeting, uh, that maybe given what everybody is going through right now, um, just a little boost about how special teachers are, have always been and still are, despite the fact that we're not attending school the way that we normally do, might be a, a nice little pickup for a morning session of the seminar. So I wanted to just share with you a little microcosm of the Tuesdays with more experience. For those of you who, who haven't read the book, and of course I don't assume anybody has, uh, Maury, the Maury of Tuesdays with Maury, was my old college professor at Brandeis University. He stood about this high, he had silver hair, green eyes, a crooked tooth smile, and a kind of way of making you feel that you were the first student he'd ever taught, even though he'd taught thousands of them. And I met him my very first day of college in 1975 at Brandeis University. And I had signed up for his class uh, ahead of time as you do when you go to college. And it was an introduction to sociology or something like that. And I walked into the classroom and there were nine kids in the class. And being a typical freshman, I immediately said, no, 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 no. This is much too small a class. If I cut it, they'll know I'm not here. I wanted like a nice big, you know, 400 person class that I could fall asleep in the back or take the morning off. And so I was actually leaving the room to drop the class and go back to the registrar when he started to call roll. And one of the problems when your name begins with A is that you can't get out of a room quickly enough. And so I heard him say, you know, Mitchell album. And I was halfway out the door. And if I had just kept walking, he never would have known it was me because, you know, I hadn't identified myself. And if I had just kept going, I promise you, I wouldn't be speaking to you right now. And I wouldn't have the entire life that I have had on such a small little thing, such a small little moment, your, your whole life can change. And so being kind of a guilty student and I heard my name, I kind of slid back in and I sheepishly raised it with my hand and said, here. And he said, uh, is it Mitch or Mitchell? Which do you prefer? I'm sure that doesn't mean anything to you, but for me, I was kind of, you know, appreciative that he asked because I have one of those names that depending on what the teacher wants to decide, it's either Mitch or Mitchy or Mitchell or whatever. And so I said, uh, well, Mitch, my, my friends call me Mitch. And he said, all right, Mitch, it is then. And Mitch. And I said, yeah. And he said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. So I knew cutting the class was out of the question at that point. And uh, that began what turned out to be a really beautiful relationship that Maury and I had that spanned all four years. I ended up taking every class that he offered. I ended up majoring in sociology, not really because I was all that interested, to be honest, but uh, would have been a shame to waste all those credits. Uh, in fact, by the time I reached my senior year, I had run out of classes to take with Maury. And so I actually did a honors thesis with him. And you might be amused by this as such was the state of uh, liberal arts education in the Northeast America in 1979 that I was able to write and get credit for an honors thesis whose title was, and I'm not making this up, football, its role in society, which is still the seminal work on that topic, I believe, and uh, maybe the only one. Uh, but it gave me a chance to continue to visit with Maury and, you know, it really was more like an uncle nephew sort of relationship. I mean, we, we walked around campus together. We had meals together. 
Uh, it delighted me to find out that Maury was as much of a slob when it came to eating as I was, not, not because he lacked manners, but because he was always so effusive with these ideas. You know, he always wanted to tell me, you know, follow your heart and follow your dreams. Don't worry about the grades or how much money you're going to make, you know, do what comes passion, all these wonderful big ideas. But sometimes he would forget to chew. And uh, I remember he used to eat these egg salad sandwiches and I'd be sitting across from him in these little yellow projectiles would come flying out of his mouth and I'd have to, you know, like a, like a hockey goalie or something to avoid them. But it was just another element of this man who endeared himself to me, not just as a teacher, but as a man, which I think the best teachers do. And on graduation day, I got him a briefcase. Now, I didn't have a dime to my name then, so it had to be the cheapest briefcase made. But I had his little initials, like I think they rubbed it on with a little piece of stencil or something. And I gave it to him. And you would have thought I was giving him a brick of gold. I mean, he turned the thing all the way around and he was starting to cry, which wasn't unusual for Maury. And he, and he, and he took me around and he said, Mitch, you're one of the good ones. Promise me you'll stay in touch. And I said, okay, I will. Promise me. I said, okay, I promise. Say it in a sentence. I said, okay, Maury, I promise I'll stay in touch. I promise I'll stay in touch. And then I graduated and I went off into the world to pursue all the various things that maybe you've seen or heard of. And I proceeded to break that promise every day, every week, every month, and every year for 16 years. 16 years without a word or a phone call or a letter. Now I can hear what you're all too polite to say or react to and that is how could you do that you just said you were so close to him well it seems to be a phenomenon that it's not that we intend to forget our teachers right you get out of school and you think you know i'm going to go back and visit over the summer and you don't know, in a couple of years pass you know i'm going to give him a call and and then maybe i'll go visit and but you don't and then a couple of years maybe i'll write a letter and then i'll call maybe i'll go visit and meanwhile if you're like me and like a lot of other people in the world your life your career starts to take off, you know, and starts to pull you into different places. And in my case, you know, I, I when I got into journalism, it happened very quickly. And I came to Detroit very young and I became a young columnist here. And and suddenly, you know, you're you're traveling around the world and you're flying from here to there and you get an award and you get a paycheck and you're talking to Michael Jordan or you're talking to Barry Sanders. And you're on TV, and you get another award and somebody asks for your autograph, you get another paycheck, another award, another paycheck. And one day you wake up and you say this was meant to be. I was hatched out of the egg with all this success coming my way. We forget the people who make us the kind of people who can have that kind of success. We forget our teachers. And I forgot mine for 16 years. Now, during that time, Maury continued to teach small classes of kids at Brandeis University. He didn't aspire to become the head of the department, the dean. He didn't have to go to Harvard to prove how intelligent he was. He was happy reaching a handful of, of kids every year, making a difference in their lives. And when he wasn't doing that, you know, he, he didn't lead a conventional life. He didn't watch a lot of television or go to movies. He would have people over for discussion groups. Uh, he would dance. He loved to dance. He used to go to this church in Harvard Square uh that uh, had a program on wednesday nights called dance free and you would pay five bucks to go in i never understood that by the way if it was called dance free why did you have to pay five bucks but he would go in and you could dance any way you wanted with anybody you wanted and he would go in in like sweatpants and a towel and he danced the merengue and the tango and uh, at the time they were playing rock and roll music but it didn't seem to matter to him he would just swirl around the floor and dance with all the kids. And none of them knew that he was this learned professor. They just thought he was this kooky old white haired guy. And, and that's how Maury was. He sort of went through his life um, wringing all the joy he could out, out of the day, you know, like a rag that you just keep bringing more drops. And then the next day you wake up, and there's another wet rag and you just wring it all out. And that's how he sort of went through his life, through his 50s and 60s and into his 70s. And then in his 70s, he began to notice a change in his body. Long walks would leave him tired. He'd say, ah, I'm getting old. You know. Then he would step out of the car and lose his balance and fall. One time he was at a wedding with his wife and they were dancing and he just fell. 
just fell onto the floor in the middle of the dance. And as he would later say to me, Mitch, I never fell when I danced. And so he began that long process that we have of trying to find out, you know, what was wrong with him. And he went to one doctor and another specialist, another doctor, and another specialist. It took nine months to find out why he was, his body was betraying him until finally on a, on a beautiful spring day, he sat inside a neurologist's office and the doctor said to him, Maury, I have some tough news. You have ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And Maury, who grown up in Brooklyn and knew who Lou Gehrig really was, said, Lou Gehrig's disease, that's fatal. And the doctor said, yeah, it is. And Maury said, well, it, it used to be fatal, you mean, right? Like back when Lou Gehrig was playing, but they have a cure for it now, right? No, the doctor said, there's no cure. Well, how long do I have left to live? Maury asked. Hard to say, the doctor said, maybe a couple years. And Maury left that doctor's office and walked out to the same beautiful spring day that he had left behind just an hour or so earlier. And he took in the view. He saw the blue skies. He saw people riding bicycles, someone playing Frisbee, people shopping, going about their lives. And a voice inside of him screamed out, hey, hey, what's going on? Don't you know what just happened to me in that doctor's office? Isn't everybody in the world supposed to come up and say, we heard the news, it's terrible. No more Frisbee, no more bicycles, no more blue skies. We're all gonna get gray. The whole world's gonna be gray because you got a death sentence. And he waited for that to happen, but it didn't happen. And so on the steps of that building, my old professor made a very profound decision. He could either go this way, be angry, why me, be bitter all the rest of his days, or he could go this way and try to find something positive in this terribly negative hand that he had been dealt. And because he'd always been more positive than negative, and because he'd always been a teacher, he chose this way. And he decided he would teach about what it was like to die, right up, up to the day that he died. After all, he said, everybody's gonna go through this, right? Everybody's gonna die at some time. Maybe I'll go through something that I can share with other people and it will help them. That's what I do, that's what teachers do. They take the knowledge that's been imparted to them and they share it with other people. And so even as ALS began its terrible march through Maury's body, and if any of you have any experience with this disease and you know what I'm talking about, it's, it's just beyond cruel. It snips the connection between your brain and the rest of your body. And so you slowly lose the capacity to move. You slowly lose use of your arms, use of your legs, other parts of your body, even to the point that you, you, you can't speak anymore. And yet your mind stays perfectly intact throughout the whole process. So you're fully aware of the horror that's happening to you right up into the day you die. And with Maury, it began with his feet and worked its way up sort of his body. And even as he lost the ability to walk, even as he went to a cane and then to a walker and then to a wheelchair, even as he lost the ability to button his own shirt, to brush his hair, to brush his own teeth, even as he lost the ability to wipe his own rear end, and he needed somebody to do that for him like a baby. Throughout this whole process, the knocking over every domino that you and I call regular life, throughout this process, he taught, he taught. He invited people to come in, ask me questions. What do you wanna know? He would say, don't pay any attention to this body. That's the carton I was shipped in. It's not me. I'm still here. Look at my eyes. I'm still here. You wanna do me a favor? Don't treat me like I already died. Engage with me, ask me questions. And he kept doing this and inviting people in and talking, holding these little seminars. And eventually a reporter from the Boston Globe came out and wrote a little story about this strange old professor who was teaching his last class in dying. And this story found its way down to the desk of one Ted Koppel, who at the time hosted a program called Nightline. And next thing you know, Nightline was coming up to Maury's house in West Newton, Massachusetts to do what would be the first of three episodes about Maury's battle 
with ALS and his continuing to teach. And when that first episode aired, 700 miles away in my nice, comfortable home in my nice, comfortable town on my kind of large TV screen, I was doing the great American male tradition. You know, when I came upon the Nightline program and I did a double take because there on the screen was this thin, sickly, white haired version of my old college professor, Maury Schwartz, talking about what it was like to die. And it was only through that chance flipping of the remote control that I happened to find out that this man who had meant so much to me 16 years earlier, now only had a few months left to live. Well, you can imagine when something like that happens, you're horrified, you're embarrassed, you're saddened. What are you going to do? I decided I would make a phone call. How brave of me. One phone call. That's all I was going to do. I found his number. It was still listed. I dialed it. A nurse answered. She handed him the phone. And I still remember I heard him say hello. And I said exactly this. Professor Schwartz, my name is Mitch Album. I was a student of yours in the 70s. I don't know if you remember me. And back then, when I was a kid and a student, I used to call him coach. It's a sports affectation. I coach, how you doing, coach? And when I said these, this sentence to him, I'm Mitch Album. I don't know if you remember me. The first thing he said to me after 16 years, how come you didn't call me coach? Needless to say, by the time the conversation was over, I was coming to visit him. Guilt is a very powerful motivator, you know. So I went out and I visited him and I saw a man in a wheelchair who invited me inside to eat. I thought we were gonna have egg salad again, but no. I watched him try to eat a little piece of tomato and he tried to lift it up. His hands were trembling, tried to get into his mouth, it fell off. He went after it again. He tried to get it in his mouth. It fell off again. A third time, he finally got it in. It took him a minute just to chew this one tiny little piece of tomato. And yet, throughout the whole time we were there, he never complained about his situation, never bemoaned his fate. He was just so happy to see a student of his come back. And he talked about all these amazing things that were happening in his life and this Nightline program and how people had gotten back in touch with him, like me. And when I flew home that night, I said to myself, you know, you're 37 years old, you're perfectly healthy, and he's 78 years old and dying. And he seems 10 times more content with his life than you are with yours. What's the matter with this picture? And I began to go back the following Tuesday, the following Tuesday, the next Tuesday, the next Tuesday, and all the Tuesdays that Maury had left in his life to try to get the answer to that very basic question, what do we know when we are really looking death in the face that could inform all the rest of our lives and tell us what's important? And wouldn't it be great to know that knowledge now when we're young enough and healthy enough maybe to do something about it? And so each week, Maury and I talked about some subject or another, family, marriage, money, you name it. And Maury would be able to say, this matters this really doesn't matter. You think this matters now, but when you get to where I am, and you will get to where I am, it's not going to matter. And we touched on so many different topics, and that became the underpinning of, of that book. But the, the, the one I just want to share with you here before I wrap up happened very um, accidentally. I, I noticed that other people would come you know, to visit Maury on other days, but once in a while they come on a Tuesday. And I saw this enough to see that there was a pattern that people who didn't really know him that well, maybe they had just seen him on Nightline, that they, you know, they, they were gonna, they, they just felt that they should come see him. They were scared to talk to somebody who was dying. And so they would have a strategy, you know, they come in with a strategy with photographs or things like that. They'd say, I'm gonna cheer him up, I'm gonna get these pictures, I got all this stuff, I'm ready to go. And they'd sit outside his office and finally the door would open and and they would go in and the door would close and they'd come out an hour later in tears. But they were crying about their love life, their divorce, their work, whatever. 
And they would say, well, I don't know what happened. I went in and I tried to cheer him up. But after a couple of minutes, he started asking me about my life. So I started telling him and they started really asking me. So I started telling him and then he really has, I really opened up. And next thing I know, I was crying. But I went in to try to cheer him up, but he ended up cheering me up. And I watched this happen so many times. And finally, I, I went into more and said, I don't get it. If ever anyone had finally earned the right to say, let's not talk about your problem. Let's talk about my problems. It would be you, right? If ever anyone had earned the line, you think you got it bad. Look at me. I can't walk. I can't move. I need someone to turn my head just so that I can see you. You've hit the mother load of sympathy here, Maury, I said. Why don't you take advantage of it? And he looked at me as if I had just stepped out of a spaceship and he said, Mitch, why would I ever take from people like that? Taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. Giving makes me feel like I'm living it is a profound little sentence. It also rhymes, so it's easy to remember. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And we know that it's true deep down because we know that the opposite is false. Taking never really makes you feel alive. You know, oh, it's the basis of commercialism and Madison Avenue and all the rest of it. You know, we have commercials that whatever you take is gonna make your life better. You know, take this deodorant, so mm, my life is better. You know, get this new washing machine. Now my life is happy, you know? but it's, it doesn't work. We know that we're all like kids on, on Christmas morning. You ever see a 10 year old on Christmas morning, put a box in front of them, oh, this is great. What else you got, you know, you wanna move on. In fact, I'll prove it to you. I can't see all of you, but I'm assuming you're all of driving age. Some may be more advanced than that. So think back on the cycle of cars that have been in your life, right? Go back to the very, very first one, very first car that you got to drive, whether it was yours or somebody else. What was the one thing you cared about? Please, God, let it run, right? You just wanted it to start so that you could get in the car and go to the mall with your friends or whatever it was, right? Then you get a little older and you say, you know, if I could just have my own car, used car, whatever, you get a used car, you know, and then they say, boy, if I could just one day get a new car, I could never want anything more than that. Just a, just a new car, you know, I just want to smell the smell and the sticker. So you finally get a new car, you know, and then you get married, you have a family. So, well, we just get something a little bigger, you know, just need something a little large. I could never want anything more than that once we have something big enough for all the kids, you know, and then suddenly it gets a little later and you say, I know it's crazy, I know it's nuts, but, uh, you know, I've always wanted a convertible. There, I said it. If I could just have a convertible, I could never want anything else. So you finally buy yourself a convertible and you're driving around town in a convertible and you look over and say, boy, those SUVs look pretty nice, you know, right? Poor man want to be rich. Rich man want to be king. King isn't satisfied till he rules everything. That's not me. That's Bruce Springsteen. But it's true, right? You know, the taking never makes you feel alive. You know, it, we, we understand this. The more you take, the more you just feel like empty. Whereas the more you give, the more you feel that you have done something. I always point to this rather poignant example of 9-11 and the phone calls that they have collected from those burning buildings and those doomed planes. You know, they're all in a museum now in New York. You can actually listen to them. And if you do, it's really remarkable. It doesn't matter, male, female, black, white, national, international, young, old, to a person to a person, if they were able to get a phone call out during those doomed moments, they called their husband, their wife, their children, and they said, I called to tell you I love you. I called to tell you I love you. Not honey sell the stock, you know, not even I called to hear you say you love me. In that moment, when they were really looking death in the face, when it was really real, what gave them comfort was giving their love to somebody else. I called to tell you, I love you. Giving is living. And it is to me, the cornerstone of what teaching is about. It is the essence of what the art of teaching is about. Teachers give, they give endlessly, they give constantly, and they give throughout the course of their career. Are they always rewarded? Are they always remembered? Well, maybe not at the moment right after it's done. But look at me. 
it took me 16 years to get back to an old college professor of mine. But when I did, it became the most special relationship outside of my own family members that I've ever had in my life. And I'll close with the last thing that Maury told me on the final Tuesday that we visited. Uh, by that point, he was so shriveled by the disease and he, he was in bed, which he hated to be in bed. He said, if, I'm, if you're in bed, you're dead. But on that last Tuesday, he was in bed instead of his in office. And he asked if he could hold my hand. He could barely speak. His voice was just a whisper. And he said, I have a favor to ask you. And I said, okay, anything. He said, after I die, I want you to come visit me at my grave. I said, well, okay, of course I'll do that. He said, not the way other people visit. Don't come and get out of the car, leave the engine running, and put down some flowers, and get back in the car. I want you to come when you have some time. Bring a sandwich, bring a blanket, and talk to me about what's going on in the world, what's going on in your life. And I said, wait a minute, you want me to come to a cemetery, have a picnic at your tombstone, and talk to the air? Exactly, he said, just like we're talking now. And I said, well, Maury, it's not going to be like we're talking now, because let's face it, you're not going to be able to talk back. And he looked at me as if I were being very naive, and he said, well, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm dead, you talk. I'll listen. And I laughed when he said that, but three days later when Maury passed away and I began to write this book, which was written to pay his medical bills and no other reason. And all the money that we were given for it went to pay his medical bills. I kept thinking back to that sentence, you talk, I'll listen. And I realized that was a microcosm of everything that he tried to teach me and everything that I tried to say in that book. Because if you lead your life as Maury did, giving to people, sharing with people, teaching people, as all of you do, then when you're gone, you're not 100% gone. You live on inside the heads and hearts of everybody you've touched. And they can talk to you, not because they believe in ghosts or seances, but because you spent time putting your voice inside them. And it rings around in their head. It's a little bit like a penny in a piggy bank. You know, if you put a penny in a piggy bank, for all intents and purposes, it's gone, right? It's gone forever. You're never going to see it again. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone. But if you take the piggy bank, you shake it, there it is. That voice is inside. And in that way, death ends a life, but not a relationship. And this is particularly true for teachers. The influence that you have rings around in your students' heads. And whether they get back in touch with you after 16 years or not, whether you get one of those letters years later saying, dear Miss such and such or dear Miss such, just wanted to tell you, I always remember you fondly, you made a big difference in my life. For every one of those letters that you get, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of other students who still remember you, who are still influenced by you talk, I'll listen and the words that you put inside their, their heads and hearts. And for me, that goes on for Maury, even, even still. And in that way, you touch one person, you touch the world. You touch one student, you touch the world. And if you don't think that's true, or you think it's just a corny way to wrap up a corny talk, then look at me. You know, why are you listening to me? Why was I asked to speak to you? You don't necessarily know me. You certainly didn't know Maury. He wasn't rich, he wasn't famous, but he was a teacher who took time in his dying days to teach a wayward student what was important in life. And I wrote a small book to thank him basically to pay his bills. And somebody read it, somebody read it, somebody read it, somebody read it. Now look how large his classroom has grown for a man who's not even here to teach it. That book is the biggest selling memoir in the history of publishing. It's published in 52 countries around the world, 50 something languages. And Maury Schwartz never read a word of Tuesdays with Maury.
and yet he's teaching people all around the globe. And every one of you has that same impact. So during this tough time, when maybe it's possible to feel like, oh my God, what difference am I making? You are making a difference. You have always made a difference. Maury asked that his tombstone read, a teacher to the last. And I think from all the good teachers and all of you, I think that probably is an epithet that you would not mind having either. So I salute you for what you're doing and thank you for all the talking and listening that has gone on between you and your students. And we'll continue to do so, especially when we get more back to normal, which I hope is very soon. So thank you for listening to me. I'll be happy to take a question, a couple of questions if you like. Good morning, Mitch. This is Ann Craft. Um, I am moderating the Q&A and there are a number of comments just thanking you for your story and um, sharing your morning with us. So I wanted to relay that. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, one of them is that, what do you think Maury would think of Google and Zoom teaching if we were able to tell him what was currently going on with the pandemic and the format that the teacher has had to take? What advice do you think he would give us? Well, I can tell you he would hate it. Um because Maury was so much about human contact, human touch. Uh, you know, he was a touchy feely professor back in the days that you didn't get in trouble for that. And uh, he would have had a hard time with it. But I think he probably would have said, you know, well, use it not just for the teaching, but use it to try to find out what are the problems that the kids are dealing with on the other side of the screen, somehow make eye contact with them through that image and try to do a one on one thing uh, periodically with the kids to try to find out exactly what they were missing, because he was all about human connection and our human connections have been severed by this. And look, this is delightful and I'm very pleased to be able to speak to everybody, but I can't see a single person. I see Jamie Fitzpatrick's portrait in front of me the entire time. Uh, and now I see you, Anne, but I can't see everybody. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this book and the story before, but I can look into the eyes of the audience. And of course, you're all facing the same thing. So I think he'd be extremely frustrated by it, but he would probably say, you know, find a way to do one on one to make sure the kids know that you are thinking about them in that way. And you're not allowing the distance of a computer to you know, to define teaching. And to get in the way of that human connection. Right. Um, thank you. One of the things that you said was that um, giving makes me feel like I'm living. One of the things that Maury said. And and I, know, I, I agree with you that um, sometimes when you are not feeling well, when you're feeling depressed, when you know, I know that this is something that I do. You go volunteer, you go do something else and give back to someone else. And it always makes you feel better. And I think that's what you were getting at. Um, but at the same time, teachers give and give and give and give and give. And at what point do does giving become um, too much? Well, I think the answer, first of all, I, I'm of the belief that giving is never too much because I, I believe that that's why we're here. Um, I operate an orphanage in Haiti, some of you may know, that so for 11 years now and every month of my life I'm there. Uh, I've never missed a month in 11 years. I'm leaving on Thursday again. Um, it's a very poor orphanage. Uh, I, I sleep in a, in a, on a mattress that's maybe two inches thick in a crowded room that's, that we have no power at night and you, know, you lie there with the sweat coming down until you can fall asleep. And yet I will tell you that I always sleep through the night. I always wake up ready to go. And I, I, I've remarked now after 11 years, I never get better sleep than when I'm there. Mm -hmm. And, and I have a, a beautiful house here and a nice big thick mattress and all the rest of it. But the, and, and I never stop working when I'm there and I never stop giving when I'm there. From the minute I get up to the minute I go to sleep, that's all I do. Um, but that sense of purpose 
gives me better sleep. You know, uh, it, it actually changes your mentality. So, but I get what you're asking because on the other end is taking, and there are a lot of parents and kids and administrations and all who just take and take and take and take and take. Okay, you've worked, you've worked 40 hours, work 45, you work 45, work 55, you worked 100, work 110. The, the answer to your question to me is, you know when you have overgiven when you're losing yourself. If you lose your sense of your own self, if you lose the feeling like I'm nothing unless I'm giving, then you have overdone it because you, in order to have something to give, you have to be yourself. You know, you're not just a vessel. You're not just a body that, you know, you have to have your thoughts, your, your own perceptions, your own personality, your own experiences. If you don't have any other experiences, but just being in the classroom, then you don't have that much to offer because there's nothing from the outside. So when you start to feel you're losing your own sense of identity and every minute is just the classroom and it's time to pull back. And I think the best teachers, and I'm, I'm sure Maury would say the same thing. You know, you can't sacrifice your own sense of self or worth or identity for anything. Uh, right. classroom. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna ask one other quick question because we've had several people ask it. Do you have any teachers that stand out um, in your K-12 education and why? Oh my. <laughs> yeah. uh, wow. First of all, you're asking me to go back a long way. To <laughs> um, my goodness, yes. Uh, okay. Um, my kindergarten teacher, um, uh, Mrs. Baselli, uh we had a little exercise where they asked us to stand up and say what we want to be when we get older. And I stood up and said, I want to be a trash man because at the time I liked the trucks that came by and they would pick up the trash. And everybody in the class laughed. Of course, I was embarrassed, you know. And uh, she said, um, what? No, stop laughing and nobody should laugh. As long as you're the best trash man that you can be, that's a great, that's a great idea, you know? And uh, I remember like feeling saved by, by her comments. And also now when I look back on it, the wisdom of it, you know, to say, if just be good at what it is that you choose to be and be the best that you can be at it. And that's good enough. And that was in kindergarten. I had high school teachers who, um, encouraged me to no end. Uh, I mean, um, told me that I was a good writer, um, told me that uh, to believe in myself. Um, I, you know, told me that that uh, not to worry about what other kids were thinking, you know, that there was life beyond high school. And, and it was important to think about life beyond high school. I went to a, uh, I, I, I flipped school. So I went to a, a a, a small religious school uh, for junior high school. And then I went to high school in a public high school with 6,000 kids. And I had an English teacher there who said to me, you know, um, you have to think beyond this place because it was a pretty, you know, limited thing and nobody ever left our little town and nobody ever, nobody ever moved out, you know. And she said, uh, you have something that, you know, maybe not every kid has, and it's gonna be your curse and it's gonna be your blessing. Um, I got beat up that year in the locker room by a football guy who found out that I had gotten straight A's on my report card. And I didn't even know this kid. And he just rammed me up against the locker and, and you know, just, just pounded me. So you the asshole who got straight A's. And you know, and I was thinking about lying and making up a C in history or something just so that I wouldn't get beat up. And uh, when I went to a teach this teacher and she said, look, you know, don't worry about that. You know, think beyond where you are right now and, and take what you have. And there's a big world waiting for you out there and you're probably gonna leave this town. And you know, just because nobody else does doesn't mean that you can't. And I did, um, so. Um, I never found that kid again either. But, uh, probably a good thing. <laughs> probably likely incarcerated at the moment. But uh, so, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, God, they, they were endless. My teachers have affected me in every which way, and up to college, and, and obviously, you know, sure. I wrote the book. Um, so yes, there's there's no doubt. And I teach now myself. You know, I teach the kids uh, in Haiti all the time, and and I take the lessons that I learned from the teachers I had and employ them with the kids there. You know, I, these kids are really have nothing you know they've been abandoned left to die out in the woods things like that and we find them they come live with us so um i've been influenced by teachers tremendously awesome well i want to read one of the comments to you while we wrap up here um it says mitch you may not have been able to look into our eyes during your presentation but you spoke directly to our hearts thank you well, and any chance i get to speak to teachers is an honor Thank you all for doing what you do. Yes, thank you. We are going to turn it back over to Jamie Fitzpatrick, who has a couple of quick announcements before we have a break. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks, Ann. And Mitch, I couldn't agree more with the, the words of the, the teacher that uh, Ann just spoke about in terms of speaking to our hearts. So I've heard your story a few times and it just never gets old. It's just a, a message that, uh, that really resonates with all of us. So thank you. Before we go on break, I'd like to just provide a couple of updates. Um, we have worked with the Michigan Department of Education and developed a series of five SEL professional development courses for school personnel. These been, have been available for quite some time. We've had thousands of educators around the state access these courses. They are free and they are eligible for sketches. And after the conference, we will email you uh, directions on how you could uh, enroll in these. They are on our website, but and you can see the title of the, of the five courses. We just wanted to make everyone aware of those. Obviously, SEL has become, it was an important issue before the pandemic, but it has become even more so uh, important for all of us, uh, regardless of our, our role at, uh, in a K-12 school setting. And then the second thing I'd like to give you an update on is a new podcast called Bright that we are just ramping up that highlights the innovative work that teachers are doing around classrooms in the state of Michigan uh, during some really, really difficult times. And in this podcast series, we are talking to teachers who are inspiring other educators. We're hearing you know, firsthand what they're doing in their classrooms and how these uh, changes are impacting uh, their colleagues, their, their students, their families that they're servicing. And then oftentimes what advice they have for their, for their colleagues. So, Again, we will send out information on how you can access uh, this podcast and would like to encourage people to, to think about uh, listening to, uh, to your colleagues from around the state. We are scheduled to take a break. We will start back up at 9.15 sharp and look forward to seeing everyone back in their breakout sessions at that time. <laughs> 